July and August are, are months when there's not a lot of uh, activity, uh, but as it says there, everybody's welcome to the service. Uh, there's no midweek. Uh, Sabbath schools closed also uh, uh, for, for the summer. And then there is, uh, some of you well, most may not be aware of it, but there is a presbytery uh, prayer meeting uh, on the first Monday evening of each month. If you want to join that, you do by Zoom. You can just listen to the prayers. You don't, you're not committed at all uh, to, to, to pray, but those go on monthly, and the details of that uh, are on the sheet. One other thing I would say, too, it's not on the announcement sheet, but uh, there was an announcement last week about the uh, financial reports. Uh, there's copies for every family and the congregation, and you should take a copy and have a look through it. Uh, the financing uh, of our denomination, our own congregation, but the other congregations is a very important uh, a part of, of uh, our Christian witness. So every family should have at least, and there is copies on the best, on the best wheel table. So if you haven't got one, you should take one uh, today. I think that's all the announcements, and I'll just hand over to uh, uh, Kenny for today's service. Well, good morning or good afternoon to you all. It's lovely to be here with you on this Sabbath day to worship and to praise our great God. I was uh, surprised on Friday evening whenever I got the, the message from John, but I was glad to be able to step in uh, and to help you in uh, your, it's not vacancy, but uh, as John is recovering from uh, his illness. So let us now worship God, from sing singing from Psalm 33. Psalm 33, we're going to sing verses 1 to 6, and the tune is Perfect Way, 185. The psalmist calls us to worship God. He says, you righteous in the Lord rejoice. The upright should him praise. Sing praise to him with ten stringed harp. Thanks with the lyre now raise. A new song sing to him and play with skill. Shout joyfully. The Lord's word it is right and true. His works done faithfully. We're going to be thinking this morning about the first words of the scriptures. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The psalmist brings our attention to this. In the middle of verse 3, he said, The Lord's word made the heavens high, his breath their host above. The waters of the sea he brings together as a heap, and in storehouses he lays up the mighty oceans deep. So let us join together now to, in singing verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 33. And the tune is 185, Perfect Way. Let us stand to praise God. Let us pray. Our great, eternal, and triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come into your presence today on this, your day, to worship and to praise your great and holy name. We come before you, the one who is our creator, our sustainer, and our redeemer. We rejoice that you are the one who has called the entire universe into existence. There is not one stray molecule of this entire cosmos of, over which you are not in control. We rejoice that you are the one who, has, who called everything into existence by your word. And everything consists and holds together by the power of your word, by the word of your power. We rejoice that in everything that we see, we are driven to acknowledge you as God. And yet, in Adam we have fallen. By nature we are not 
children of God. By nature, we are children of wrath. We have rebelled against you in Adam. And yet, you are our Redeemer. You're the one who has drawn us to yourself through Jesus Christ. You're the one who has opened up that way of access into your presence through the shed blood of our dear Savior. And it is through him that we come to you this morning. It is through him, through his life, death, and resurrection that we can come and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, this morning that you would grant us the help of your spirit as we come to you through Jesus Christ. As we would read your word, as we pray to you, as we sing your glorious psalms, and as we listen to your word read and preached, we pray that you would help us to see Jesus Christ. We pray that our hearts might be strangely warmed, that, we, that our hearts may be drawn out after you. We pray that as we attend on to these means of grace, that you would build us up in our most holy faith. That if, if there are any amongst us who are as yet outside of Christ, may they be drawn to him irresistibly. And we pray most of all that the name of Jesus Christ will be magnified that he might have all the preeminence. We pray these things in his name, asking also for the forgiveness of our sins through him. Amen. Turn please in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Very familiar words to us, but please pay attention to the reading of God's word. Genesis chapter 1, we read all of it and down to verse 4, sorry, the end of verse 3 in chapter 2. So let us hear the word of the Lord. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was the morning, the third day. 
And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to, to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping... Why would I need to rub out things that I had planned to do? Yes? Once I've done them, that's right. After I've done them, I can rub them out. Any other wi ideas? Yeah? If you make a mistake. If I make a mistake, that's right. If I write it down on the wrong day, I can rub it out. Any other reason I might need to rub out something that, that I'd planned to do? Any ideas? What about if plans change? What about if something was cancelled? Or something had to be postponed? You see, whenever we make plans, we always have to be prepared for the plans to change. Can you name someone whose plans never change? God's plans never change. That's right. In Psalm 32 and verse 11, the psalmist tells us, the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. Now, what does he mean, stand firm forever? What does that mean? Yeah. That it's not going to break. It's not going to break. That's right. God's plans never break. That's a good way of describing it. God's God's plans never break down. God's plans always come to pass. Name some of the things that God has planned. Have you any idea? Did God plan your hair color? He did. Did God plan your eye color? He did. Did God plan the day that you were born? He did. Yes. And all those plans came through? Yes? Something else that God planned. God planned that he would send Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago to die for us and to rise again. And where is Jesus Christ now? Yes? Heaven. He's in heaven. And he's there praying for us. And there is something else in God's plan. One day Jesus Christ will come back again. And, he, and we, if we are believers, we will live with him forever. It's very important that you're all ready to live with Jesus Christ forever, that you're trusting in him and that you're resting in him. Okay, thank you very much for listening so carefully. Now you can all go back to your seats. Thank you. Let us join together again in singing from Psalm 139.
Psalm 139, we're singing verses 1 to 4. And the tune is Holly, number 15. As we will think about in a few moments, there is nowhere in the universe where God is not. God is everywhere. The psalmist tells us this, especially in in verse 4, stanza 4. Where can I from your spirit be? Where from your presence can I flee? You are in heaven, if there I fly. And in the grave, if there I lie. This is of supreme comfort for us as believers. So let us sing together these words. Psalm 139, stanzas 1 to 4, and let us Stand and remain standing for prayer. Let us praise God. Let us again draw to God in prayer. Our great eternal God, we rejoice that you are everywhere present. That there is nowhere on this universe that we could go where we would be outside and beyond your presence. This is of extreme comfort to us. We rejoice that we are as much with you here in this valley of the shadow of death as we shall be whenever we sit at table in your presence forever. We rejoice, Father, that you have given to us all the blessings which we enjoy. We rejoice that you have given us enough health and strength to be here today to worship you together in the congregation. We pray, Father, for those who are suffering illness and other trials. We pray especially, Father, for those who are suffering from COVID. We think of John. We think of others in the congregation who are affected by it. We pray that you would give them 
a speedy recovery. We pray that as they spend this time recuperating, that they would know your presence, that by your Holy Spirit you would draw near to them and sanctify to them even this time of illness. We pray, Father, for those who are going through times of other sorrows and times of other trials. We think of those who are continuing continuing to suffer the pain of grief and bereavement. We pray that you would be with them. Comfort them in the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that through him death has been defeated. Through him the grave no longer has a sting. We pray for any who are going through any other trial. We pray that you would draw near to them, strengthen them and encourage them, comfort them in Christ Jesus by your Spirit. We pray, Lord, for those who are suffering persecution for the sake of Jesus Christ, whether at home here in this country or further afield in other lands. We rejoice that you have given to your saints such courage, such strength and stamina to be able to withstand the onslaught of persecution for the sake of Christ. We pray that you would grant them more strength, further encourage them, O Lord, so that even their persecutors might come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Savior, as Paul the Apostle, Saul the Persecutor, understood. And we pray, Father, that we in this land who enjoy such relative freedom, we pray that we might be strengthened and encouraged to stand firm for Jesus Christ, for his crown rights and his covenant, even as we are laughed at, even as we are belittled with words. May these be as nothing to us. May we rejoice that we suffer slander and gossip for the sake of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, today that wherever your word is preached, may Jesus Christ's name be uplifted. As his gospel goes forth, we pray that you would, that you would pour out your spirit, that you, we pray that you would come down, that the mountains would quake and melt at your presence. Grant unto us now hearing ears and understanding hearts. Give me the strength of mind, clarity of thought, and clarity of speech to preach your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn again in the word of God to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we're going to read from verses 1, from verse 1 to verse, to the end of verse 13. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Let us hear again the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. May the Lord bless again to us the reading of his word. We're going to consider this morning just the first verse of Genesis 1. Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I have entitled this morning's sermon simply, The God Who Is. The God Who Is. One Old Testament commentator has described the book of Genesis as a complete and well-arranged introduction to the history of the Old Testament kingdom of God. And if this is so, then what we have in these first words of Genesis is an introduction to the king of that kingdom, an introduction to God, the creator of heaven and earth. In order for us to get a thorough grasp of the sheer weight of these first ten words of God's revelation of himself in Scripture, we must consider for a few moments the purpose of the human author of this book. Genesis is the first book of Moses. If we give no further consideration to that fact, it seems a merely trivial point. Moses wrote Genesis. So what? Well, we must ask why, and for whom did he write it? Who was Moses' initial audience? That initial audience was the children of Israel, a group of about two million people who who had freshly been released from bondage to the Egyptians, and they were making their way through the wilderness. They had just witnessed the land of Egypt absolutely decimated, by a series of disasters, some of them natural, others unmistakably supernatural. And I'm sure they had some serious questions that they wanted answered. One of the most probing questions would have been, who is this God who has just done what we have seen? We sometimes forget a fact that Joshua reminds us about at the end of his life. He tells the Israelites, put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. As the children of Israel left Egypt, they left as people freshly redeemed, not only from slavery, but from idolatry. These were new believers in the Lord God of Israel. They had much to learn about this God who had redeemed them from the house of bondage. What made this God different from all the gods that they had worshipped in Egypt and from the gods of the Canaanites whose land they were about to inherit? In sheer contrast to the gods of the surrounding nations, Moses would present to the children of Israel the God of heaven and earth. This is the God whom the entire world had rejected. Not because he was laughably weak, but because he was horrendously almighty. Here was the God that the nations could not tame. And if they could not tame him, they would simply ignore him. As Pharaoh said to Moses, Who is this Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? But before Pharaoh was through, God sent him on a literal crash course in theology. Pharaoh, by the end of the tenth plague, had a better grasp as to who this Yahweh was. He is the almighty God who is greater than each and every deity worshipped by the Egyptians. 
Yahweh, was the one who made an open show of all the gods served by the Egyptians, including Pharaoh, and put them and Pharaoh to an open shame. But the children of Israel, they needed to learn about this God who had rescued them in love and in mercy. They had seen his fierce wrath. They had also seen his abundant love on display. Were they to be terrified of him? Or were they to love him? How were they to wrap their minds around him? And indeed, was that even possible? Who is this God? So Moses commences. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And with this first phrase, Moses lays the axe to every idol known to man. And he reveals the one true and living God. So I want us this morning to consider four truths about God that Moses brings out in this very first verse. I'm going to take the pattern that we have been given in the Shorter Catechism. In the first part of the answer to question four, what is God? The answer starts, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. So firstly, Moses declares a God who is spirit. Moses declares a God who is spirit. When Moses declares that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, He is teaching the church in the wilderness that all reality falls into one of two categories. There is the the category of creation and there is the category of the creator. This is a distinction that is clearly expressed throughout all of scripture. There is simply God on the one hand and everything else on the other. So when the Shorter Catechism teaches, using Jesus' own words, that God is a spirit, it is simply stressing the fact that God is not made up of anything that is created or creaturely. God is not made up of anything that is physical. He is simply and completely different from all of his created, from all of his creation. He is the creator who is distinct from his creation. He is purely uncreated spirit. You see, down through the centuries, there have been religious and philosophical ideas that claim that God is made up of both spirit and matter. They teach that God's soul is his spirit and that his body is the universe. Now that might sound strange to us, and rightly so, but the whole New Age movement is based on that whole idea. You've heard terms like mother nature. And you've heard of phrases like the universe is doing such and such. This kind of thinking grants divine qualities to things which God has created. But such thinking isn't just out there in the New Age movement. It, is, it has pervaded a particular movement which is gaining a lot of popular support in these days, the modern green environmentalist movement is taking these kinds of ideas on board. Nature is becoming personified. It is becoming a legal entity in its own right. Campaigners are demanding that nature, the environment, the environment be protected and respected for its own sake. Nature, for many, is becoming a god. Now, as Christians, we have a duty to treat creation responsibly. Some Christians that I know of just shrug their shoulders and say, what's the point in looking after it? It's all for the fire anyway. But scripture doesn't tell us that. Scripture affirms that the creation will be renovated by fire, not annihilated by fire. The old creation will be transformed into the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus says in Revelation that he will make all things new, not that he will make all new things. 
So the creation, as it is, must be treated with respect. But the difference is, it is not divine. It must be treated with respect because it belongs to the one who is divine. Now, Scripture clearly teaches us that the things which we see, the material things in the universe, in creation, are not eternal. They are not divine. But then what are we to make of those statements in Scripture that say that angels are spirits? And that teach us that we have a spiritual aspect to our, to our being, our souls. How do we understand these concepts in the light of the scriptural teaching that God is spirit? Well, we see that God has created some things that bear a greater resemblance to him than other things. We see this especially in the creation of man. Man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Not so that we might become God, but so that we might be the representatives of God in creation. There is no blurring of the distinction between God and his creation. And so does this make a difference to us, that God is, that God is spirit? It does. Since God is spirit, as Jesus said, then we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Since God is uncreated spirit, we must worship him in our spirits as they have been created by him. We know of those who attempt to offer a kind of worship to God that is merely physical, that simply goes through physical motions, Mouthing prayers, climbing mountains barefoot, making the sign of the cross. You've seen it. You've seen people doing these things. But do you engage in the worship of God in merely the physical aspect? When we were singing the Psalms, were you just mouthing the words with your mind a million miles away? Or were you paying attention to the word of God as we sung it? When we were praying, you stood, you bowed your head, but were you agreeing in your heart, in your spirit? We can just as easily go through the physical motions of true worship and not engage in true worship of God at all. And when we do this, We are to be more pitied than all. When we go through the motions of the worship that God has actually commanded in his word, without engaging the depths of our beings in that worship, that, dear friend, is obnoxious in the sight of God. God is a spirit. Let us approach him and worship him in spirit and in truth. So secondly, Moses declares a God who is infinite. Moses declares a God who is infinite. Before God created anything, there was only God. Not God plus anything. Not God plus space. Not God plus nothing. It was just God. There was nothing beyond him or outside of him. And even now, since creation, whilst not everything is God, yet God in the totality of his being is still everywhere present all of the time. God knows no limits. He has no boundaries. This is what the psalmist was telling us in Psalm 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Let me illustrate this for you using a contrast. As you sit on your seat, imagine a dust mite on the floor standing beside your feet. I don't want to uh, offend the one who's just cleaned the meeting house. It is just an imaginary exercise. I'm sure there are no dust mites. But just imagine for a moment that dust mite is at your feet. And imagine also that around your head there is a fly buzzing. 
and it lands on your head. The dust mite is at your feet. The fly is at your head. They are both experiencing your presence. But they are experiencing a different part of your presence. The dust mite is in the presence of your foot. And the fly is in the presence of your head. Neither one of them is experiencing the totality of your presence. Your whole presence is not at your head. And your whole presence is not at your feet. But this is in total contrast to God. All of God is present everywhere all of the time. This is hard. This is impossible for us to wrap our minds around. But this is what the scriptures teach. God is present in the same way in every single point of the universe and beyond at every single point in time. Why do the scriptures declare this? The scriptures declare this for our comfort. Dear child of God, if I was to say to you that you are never out of God's reach, I would be doing a complete injustice to this truth. God does not have to reach out to be near you. God is as much with you when you stumble along through the valley of the shadow of death as he will be. When you step inside the house of the Lord to dwell forever. Unbeliever, it is not for your comfort. Let me sound the warning that the scripture gives to you. If you die outside of Christ, the book of Revelation tells us that you will endure the wrath of God in the presence of the Lamb. We sometimes have this idea that those in hell are utterly separated from God. But we must remember that God is infinite and therefore he is present everywhere. In this life, God is present in a special way with his own people. In heaven, now, he is with his own people in a special way. And in an entirely new way, he will be with his own people in the new heavens and in the new earth. But he is also present in wrath against the lost for all eternity. This is a most sobering thought. So thirdly, Moses declares a God who is eternal. Moses declares a God who is eternal. Moses says that God created the heavens and the earth at a moment called the beginning. That moment was the first moment. Included in the term, the heavens and the earth, which God created, is time itself. That beginning point had no before. There was no time prior to the beginning. Just what one writer has called the deep silence of eternity. We cannot wrap our minds around eternity or eternality. You could possibly imagine a never-ending continuous succession of time. But eternity is a totally different concept. Eternity is the absence of time. And yet, as Isaiah tells us, God inhabits eternity. God is the creator of time. God was before the beginning. And even to say the words God was doesn't really make sense. As Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. God is timeless. Since God was already there at the point of the absolute beginning, then Moses is teaching us that he is eternal. He is without beginning or ending. Again, believer, this is our comfort. Moses tells The children of Israel in Deuteronomy, the eternal God is your dwelling place. The gods of the surrounding nations were creatures of time. But the God of Israel created time. And if he created time, then our times are in his hand. If he created time for the universe, then every moment we live is planned by his eternal decree. We will not live one minute less or one minute more 
than he has planned. God was in complete control of that first moment. And he is in complete control of our understanding. It is not simply everlasting life. It is eternal life. There is a difference. Everlasting life is connected with time. Eternal life is connected with eternity. We will only know that when we enter into the fullness of eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. That is life not governed by time. It is life as God knows it. It is to be wrapped up in the life of God himself. We already have a taste of this as believers. As we have gathered here this afternoon to worship, we have gathered to commune with the eternal God and he with us. The gathering of the saints is is an extraordinary event. This is where time and eternity meet. Or if you like, it is where time recedes and eternity comes close. If we really had a full understanding of what is taking place as we come to worship God in Christ Jesus, we would have chills running up and down our spines. What a privilege we have. What an undertaking to come into the presence of the triune eternal God as his blood-bought people, those to whom he has given the gift of his eternal life. But so often we come in so lightly so unconscious of what we are about. I know, I understand how much life can crowd in on us, even on the Sabbath day, and even as we gather for worship. But let us think often of the incredible nature of the ordinary things that we do together as a congregation in the worship of God. And as we have a growing sense of eternity, Our hearts will be so fixed on the wonder of God that we will feel the weightiness of congregational worship. Finally, Moses declares a God who is unchangeable. Moses declares a God who is unchangeable. God brought the heavens and the earth into existence not as some extension of his divine being, but as a distinct entity. He did not make the heavens and the earth out of his own essence. He made the heavens and the earth out of nothing. When God created, he remained what he had always been. When God created, he did not change. He remained outside of and apart from all of his creation. Creation remains creation. And God remains God. And creation did not make God happier. We're as fickle as the breeze. The idols of the Canaanites had to be placated every year in order to give a favorable harvest. Life For the Egyptians and for the Canaanites must have been a living nightmare. It must have been like having a pet lion. The moment it could turn on you and devour you. But that was not so with the God of Israel. Here was the God who had promised in covenant that he would be faithful to his own people. He has promised that while the earth remains,